everybody. Welcome to our online worship services today. We're so glad to have you as part of our Compassion family. Man, I hope you've had a great week. And if you have, awesome. It's getting ready to get better. Man, we're working our way through the book of Galatians right now. And today we're in chapter five, which is one of the mountain peaks of the New Testament. You're gonna love this passage. You're gonna feel stronger because of it. You're gonna be stronger, empowered by the Holy Spirit if you align your life with what the Holy Spirit teaches us in this chapter. Now friends, uh, we've been praying that God would bless us as we move toward the reopening of our services. Lord willing, in August, man, we don't know what's gonna happen in August, but we are praying that God would just open doors that no man can shut, and we'll be able to resume our public services in August. So please pray with us about that. Man, we're looking for that day when we can be back together as a church. Now friends, our communicator today is Pastor Ken Philbeck. Ken is the campus pastor out of our Effingham campus. He's done so many different things at our church and done them all well, but listen, he loves his campus, he loves God's word, and he loves you, and you're gonna be blessed as he takes us through Galatians 5 today. Hey, Compassion, it's great to be with you today and continuing this study of Paul's letter to the Jesus followers in Galatia. You know, a few years ago, my brother was diagnosed with cancer. He's a pastor up in Indianapolis, and he called me and he asked me to come and uh, preach for him for a couple of weekends. And so on one of those weekends, I drove up to Athens, Georgia, and picked up my daughter who was at the University of Georgia, and she drove up there with me. And it was a great opportunity just to spend some time talking, to be together on the way, and to uh, just for me actually to be able to ans ask her some questions just about her perceptions about my life, about being a dad, and even being a husband to her mom. And um, needless to say, while it was a great weekend that we were able to spend together, I wasn't actually the husband or father that I thought I was. She had a different picture of that. I asked her, I said, Megan, you know, I was the dad that was always around, right? I mean, I was always at your side. I always coached their, foot, their games, their sports teams. I, I was the coach on them. I, I, you know, was there for all the recitals. I was there for the plays. I was there for all that stuff. But I said to Megan, I said, I was always there, right? I was that kind of dad that was always there. See, I had a dad that was never there. And so I wanted to be the guy that was there. And she said, well, no, you were never there, Dad. And I had this picture of who I was. And she actually had a completely different picture of who her dad was. Now, it wasn't a bad conversation or it wasn't a bad dad. It just was her perception that I was gone a lot. It's kind of the tension that I lived in. It's a tension that I feel in my own life. It's a tension I've seen as I've gotten older. It's a tension that's a potential disconnect between who you are and who you know you should be or who you think you are. I mean, you ever live in that kind of tension? You know, there's a battle, and for some of us, it's on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment basis, and it's a battle over character that on some level, every one of us faces. And this pat battle, this pull between who I want to be, who I perceive myself to be, and who I actually am has been a, evidently it's been a constant in my life. And even though some part of me thought that ministry would inoculate me from compromise, but the truth is that all of us can cheat our values at any moment and anywhere. And we can try to depend on our own strength to get us to where we think we want to be who we want to be. And the sad thing is that far too many of us, me included, we end up compromised. We're no longer who we are lines up with who we had hoped to be. And it happens so subtly that most of the time we don't even see it coming. It's true in my life. It's probably true in your life as well, whether you're a believer or not today. But you don't just have to look at my life or your life. I mean, we can see this throughout the Bible. You know, you can see it in the life of the nation of Israel who, who one moment would depend on God and then the next moment would depend on themselves. You see it in the life of Jonah who, who thought he knew a better way and just decided to run away and he had to end up in the belly of a fish before he found out that he wasn't actually the guy he thought he was. You can see it in the life of Samson who thought he knew who he should be, what he should do, and he didn't understand that his strength was dependent on his father in heaven. It was seen in the life of David, and it was seen in Solomon, his son, and he wrote a whole book about it. And those people, me, 
we, we all thought that we knew the way. And we all worked really hard to get there. It's just that we all chose to get there in our own strength. But you, when you're on the wrong road, it doesn't matter what you believe. And it doesn't matter what your intentions are. It doesn't matter how hard you're working at it. The paths that we choose impact us more than our intentions or our motivations. And every one of us has chosen a path of some kind. Make no mistake about it. Relationally or financially, morally, spiritually. And every one of us is going to produce fruit of some kind. And it's either going to be the fruit doing, it's either going to be the fruit of doing it my own way or it's going to be the fruit of a life dependent on God. Because when it comes to producing the kind of life that God desires, determination is not going to work. Only dependence will. And that's what Paul is trying to tell the Galatians in chapter 5. Now, just as a reminder, Paul comes in and he preaches that what the law couldn't do, what working really hard at it couldn't do, Jesus did. Through Jesus, we have freedom, freedom from religion, freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, and every sin can be washed away. And this is good news because talking to a people who have spent their lives wearing themselves out, trying to be good enough to earn, uh, earn God's favor, right? Or, or somehow work hard enough and hoping to somehow appease God. But Jesus came and he was initiating something entirely different, something new, a new way of living. He was beginning a brand new movement. And this new is what Paul brought to the people of Galatia. But what we've seen in the first four chapters of Galatians is that they were taking the new and they were mixing it with the old. Paul has heard they've kind of gone back to religion. They've kind of walked back into the prison of religion and returned to the hope of earning and working your way toward favor with God. Now, they weren't giving up on Jesus. They still believed in Jesus, but they were attaching a religious system to Jesus. And so Paul explains that adding all of this religion to Jesus is just a twisting of the gospel. Jesus plus human effort, Jesus by keeping all the rules, Jesus plus a checklist of things you should and shouldn't do. It's a twisting of the gospel that Jesus revealed with his life. And they, and many of us, have fallen into the idea that if I just try hard enough to be good enough, then I can be right enough for God to love me. And that's just not what Jesus modeled or taught. That's not what he wants for you. And Paul was an expert in and a product of religion. He was a Pharisee and he understood how dangerous it was to mix the old in with the new. Listen to Paul's urgency in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. He says, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up in the slavery to the law. Don't fall back into thing, the thing that tied you down in the past. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this, if you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you, right? If you try to blend the old with the new, then you're gonna lose everything that's good with the new. Verse three, I'll say it again. If you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regu regulation in the whole law of Moses. If you reach back, into the old, then you have to take it all with you. You can't just pick and choose. Look at verse four. For if you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. If you try to add the law to grace, you end up with all law and no grace. If you try to earn it, then you're taking all the gift out of grace. Look at verse five and six. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised to us. For when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important, listen, what is important is faith expressing itself through love. The old religion and all that it represents is based on your effort. That's over. You don't have to try harder. All that matters is the change within you expressing itself through the way you live. And we live our lives not to gain something, but as a response to a God who has surrendered everything for us, a God who has expressed his love for us by giving his son and a son who gave his life because he loves us. And we love because he first loved us. And then Paul tells us that the expression of that kind of love, it doesn't happen by determination. It happens through dependence. Dependence upon the Holy Spirit, his involvement and influence should produce change in your life and in mine. Look at Galatians 5, 16. 
So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, right? Let the Holy Spirit determine your direction. And here's why that message is so important for all of us. And I, I can't think of a more simpler or more direct way to say this. It's just hard to be a Christian. I mean, it's hard to live the Christian life. A.W. Tozer, in his book, The Root of Righteousness, writes this about being a Christian. He says, a real Christian is an odd number. He feels supreme love for the one whom he has never seen, take, talks familiar, familiarly every day to someone he cannot see, expects to go to heaven on the virtue of another, empties himself in order to be full, admits he is wrong so that he can be declared right, goes down in order to get up, is strongest when he's weakest, richest when he's poorest, and happiest when he feels worst. He dies so that he can live, forsakes in order to have, gives away so that he can keep, sees the invisible, hears the inaudible, and knows that which passes knowledge. Now do you see the point? This life that we've been called to, this life with God, it is not easy. And in reality, if your life is like mine, in some ways, it's a constant battle because the call and standards of God are high. I mean, it was difficult for those early Jesus followers, and it's difficult today because it is completely at odds with the culture that we live in. And when we feel like we fail to live up to that standard, each of us experiences guilt and we carry it around with us as a burden. And the reason is, is because we have an enemy who wants to destroy us. I mean, the entire time that we're involved in this spiritual walk, we have someone who is pursuing us and laying traps for us and constantly scheming different ways to defeat us. Listen to 1 Peter 5, 8. Stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And our battle against this enemy is not like any we've ever experienced before. I mean, if you're a Christian, the devil wants to destroy your life. And I say that because if you're not a Christian, he's not going to waste much time on you because he's already got you right where he wants you. And I'm not trying to offend you, but that's just the truth. The devil is out to defeat believers. He wants to get his hands on our lives. I love the way David Jeremiah describes Satan's schemes. He writes this, he says, if you could sneak into Satan's office, wherever that might be, he's not in hell yet, and take a peek into his files, you might be surprised to find a folder with your name on it. I'm not exaggerating. He keeps a file on your name and inside that file, are all the strategies he's tried on you, the ones that have worked and the ones that have failed. He doesn't waste his time with the ones that don't work anymore. Instead, he uses variations on the strategies that have caused you to stumble in the past. And as long as they keep working, he keeps using them. Somewhere in that file cabinet is a file labeled Philbeck Kenneth. And in that file, I wouldn't be surprised to read something like this. He's prone to discouragement and depression, especially if he gets tired and overworked. Allow him to get easily frustrated and then he'll take it out on those closest to him and he'll damage relationships. Make him feel like he's not worth anything. And that way we'll let pride take over and control his behavior. Make him think good things never happen for him. Keep him busy, overcommitted, and physically tired. Do everything you can to keep him from reading his Bible and praying. That's me. What would Satan's strategy for you to be? I mean, maybe your file says gossip or angry, jealous, insecure. Maybe it's lust, racism. Maybe you're just selfish. Or maybe you're just addicted. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have an enemy whose only goal is to destroy your life. And that's why you need someone on your side to give you the strength and wisdom and the courage you need to stand strong. You see, the sinful nature is strong. Look back at Galatians 5 verse 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what the sinful nature re requires. Here's what that means. The sinful nature, or your version may say flesh, comes from the Greek word sarx. It's not a term for flesh and blood and bones and muscle. It's a word that, especially in Paul's writing, speaks of a life apart from God. The sinful nature is everything you are minus God. It's a word that describes a bent or an inclination to live apart from God, to walk and function apart from God. 
Now, the sinful nature is a source of human weakness because it is a part of man that is easily attacked and, 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 and susceptible to sin and temptation. And it's strong even after you become a Christian. I mean, you don't lose your sinful nature just because you become a Christian, just because the Holy Spirit begins to live inside of you. The sinful nature is still there and it's still strong. And so what are we going to do? I mean, the standards of Christianity are high. They're so high that we can't meet them on our own. And if that's not bad enough, we've got an enemy who's constantly working against us, doing everything he can to keep us from meeting these standards. What are we going to do? We're going to realize that we are not on our own. We are going to realize that from the moment we surrendered our lives to Christ and experienced the miracle of salvation, the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, God with us begins to live, God inside of us begins to live inside of us and help us. The Holy Spirit lives inside of every Christian to help them submit to the seemingly impossible standards of Scripture and to stand strong against the relentless attacks of our enemy. And so really, it comes down to two choices. Number one, we can either live the Christian life by grim determination, right? We can get up each day and square our shoulders and tighten our belt and set our jaw and breathe deep three times and determine that we're going to live for Jesus today no matter what, no matter if it kills us, or we're going to live by the Spirit. But before I ask you to choose, you need to make sure you understand what that means. Look again at chapter 5, verse 16. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then, and only then, right? Then you will not do what your sinful nature craves. This is a command. It's actually not a request. Paul says, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then and only then, you see that? Do you understand that? then and only then you won't be doing what your sinful nature wants. And this really is the key to how God begins to permeate every aspect of our lives. Now, the Greek word for guide is the word peripateo, and it actually means to make one's way or progress. It's a word that we can translate it a number of different ways, but it all relates back to the same basic definition. Problem is that progress is difficult. And what we have is a command that is written in the present tense. In other words, Paul is saying, continue to let the Spirit guide you. Keep on walking by the Spirit, living by the Spirit. It's not something that you choose to do once and now you're covered for the rest of your life. The main point that Paul is making is that when we live by the Spirit, we make progress in our spiritual lives. When we peripateo, we consciously choose to live by the Spirit and walk by the Spirit and let the Spirit guide us. And we make progress in the spiritual life. We move forward in our spiritual life. Listen to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. It says, And I am certain that God who began the good work in you will continue His work until it is finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. He who began a good work in you. You're not finished yet. And so each and every day as we yield to the guiding of the Holy Spirit, we are making progress. We are parapateo. Listen to me really closely. Living for Jesus and living the Christian life is not a matter of determination. It is a matter of dependence. Dependence upon the Holy Spirit on God in you. That's what spirit-controlled living is all about. That's what it means. It's about dependence. I mean, have you ever seen a baby who's learning to walk? Or do you remember when your children were first starting or beginning to walk? It, it all begins with confidence, right? I mean, that's the way it is with anything new. A baby has to feel confident enough to let go of whatever it is he or she is holding on to and then take that first step. And then from that moment on, right, that moment of that first step, walking becomes a matter of of dependence. When we walk, we literally step and depend. We step and depend. We step forward and depend on our balance and on the physical structure of our bodies to hold us up and move us forward. We step and depend. We step and depend. And to walk by the Spirit means that we are constantly making progress. We are constantly stepping and depending, moving forward in our spiritual lives by confidence in and dependence upon the Holy Spirit who lives inside of each and every one of us. And don't forget, this is a command. I mean, this is what God expects from every believer. And then the latter part of verse 16 tells us why 
we need to be obedient to that, right? To, to that command. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. And that's everything you are minus God. It's that bent or inclination inside of all of us to live and to function apart from God. And it's a strong enemy to any kind of spiritual progress in our lives because Galatians 5, 17, listen to what it says. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. He points out that there's a conflict. Now, Paul tells us that li to live by the Spirit, he immediately tells us that this is going to be difficult because we're going to find ourselves right in the middle of an internal conflict or struggle between the Spirit and our own sarks, that inclination to live and function and walk apart from God. And it's not just something that weak Christians deal with. Every Christian deals with it. It's a problem for every Christian. And Paul is very honest in his New Testament writings about his own problems with the sinful nature. Look at the words of Romans 7, 15. It says, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do, I do. And you can hear the conflict and the struggle in those words. It's the conflict between the spirit and the sinful nature between right and wrong. And basically, Paul says, listen, I'm a follower of Christ and I've devoted my life to him, but, but I've got inside me this weak spot where my enemy, the devil, and all of his forces, they land and they attack me with different temptations and seductions and they always come at me in the same place. That's the sinful nature. And when you become a follower of Jesus and the Holy Spirit begins to live inside of you, this very real and difficult tension and conflict is created. And it's basically a, con a conflict over who is going to have control or over who is going to dominate your life, the spirit or the sarks, the sinful nature. It's not just a conflict between right and wrong. It's a conflict over control because the spirit and the sinful nature both desire that which is contrary to the other. They both desire control and domination so they can produce their separate works. So there's a command and there's a conflict and then there's grace. All through the book of Galatians, Paul writes about the contrast between the law and grace, right? The law represents trying to live a, a right life based on your own efforts. And grace represents living a right life based on what God has done for you in Christ. He saved you, exalted you, and blessed you. And so the law represents human effort. Look at what Paul says in Galatians 5:18. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. And really, it's just that simple, right? I mean, it's just as simple as that. Once you have been given over to the Spirit, your life is not yours anymore. You're not controlled by the law. Think of it like this. You have two choices, right, for living a life that is right with God. You can either do it through determination or through dependence. And then Paul says, the one you choose is going to determine the fruit you produce. Look at verses 19 through 21. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are really clear, right? In other words, I don't have to tell you because you already know what they are, but I'm gonna tell you anyway, it's all the bad stuff that screws up your life. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have said before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And if I could explain it in the simplest terms possible, that is what a life of determination will bring. That is what a life of your own effort will bring. These are the fruit of your own effort. This, Paul says, is what life in your own strength will bring because you're not strong enough to say no. None of us are. But then he says there's a different way. There's actually a different path. Look at verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our loves. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
Do you know what fruit is? Fruit is the result of something that happens internally. I mean, in the vineyard or if you go into an orchard, you see the vine and you see the tree. And then because something happens that you can't see, fruit is produced. And in the same way, fruit is produced in and through, not by us, but by God through the work of the Holy Spirit. I mean, we don't just say, you know, I'm going to be good. I'm just going to be good today. And, and, and not just that, but I'm going to have patience because we know that's not true. You're going to be in traffic. I'm going to have peace. I'm going to live a peaceful life or I'm going to love people. I mean, I haven't loved anybody that uh, doesn't look like me in a long time, but I'm going to love people today or I'm going to be more joyful in general. I'm going to be more faithful and more kind. Listen, this isn't a to-do list. This is a done-to-you list. You don't just try to be better, be more good or try harder. That's determination. God is not trying to make you better or gooder. God is trying to create you into something different than this world wants for you. And it only happens through dependence. And that answers the question for a lot of us in this room. You say, you know what? I haven't felt like there's any hope in my life or I struggle to really believe that God is for me. I don't understand his purpose for this or that for my life. That's because God's process to transform you isn't just the outside, it's the inside, the inner you where your desires and motivations are. I had a really good friend when we were in college and we used to go around when we were in college and preach at different churches and he had this one sermon and he called it uh, Desire, Delight, or Desire, Determination, and Delight. He preached it everywhere we went. And basically it was kind of like this. I mean, all of us have a desire for, I mean, I think about that. I mean, you, you see me on the screen and probably most of you out there are thinking, man, I'd love to be physically, you know, in shape like that guy, like me, you know, it's a burden I deal with, you know, I face it a lot. So it's okay if you have that, but we all have a desire, right? We have a desire to be in better shape or to be physically fit or to build muscle or to, I mean, all of us would like to be better at that. The problem is that most of us don't want to go the, through the discipline of getting there, the pain and the hard work and, and, and doing, we don't want to do the discipline. We, won't, we don't want to try, we don't want to do it in order to get to the delight, but you have to go through the discipline of it to get to the delight, right? You have to work through it. You have to walk in it. You have to trust in the middle of it. And the same is true with the Holy Spirit and how he works in our lives. I mean, God changes us. We all have a desire for that. And if we follow God's strategy for change, if we're willing to surrender, if we're willing to depend, an amazing thing happens. The very things we ought to do become the very things we want to do. And then an amazing thing can happen because God changes our desires and he changes the inner person and he heals wounds and he changes things that we chased after. He changes things that are important to us and we begin to see people differently. And we begin to have a faith that expresses itself in our lives through love. And that's God's goal is to transform you. And that needs to be the strategy that we're participating in with him. And not through determination, but through surrender and dependence on the Holy Spirit. And so as we close, let me just ask you about the kind of fruit that's being produced in and through your life. Think about love. How tender is your heart towards God? How tender is your heart towards other people? I mean, do you find yourself serving other people? Do you ever find that you have a critical or judgmental spirit in your heart? How about joy? I mean, right now, what is your current irritability factor? And if you're not sure what it is, just ask the person next to you. They'd probably be willing to give you a little help with it. But how irritable do you get? I mean, are you more inclined to speak words of complaint or gratitude? Do you think you're able to choose joy in times of frustration or difficulty? How about peace? I mean, to what degree are your heart and mind at rest with God? How consistently are you troubled or anxious about something or your life? Would people you know dis describe you as someone who's contented or discontented? Here's an easy one, patience. How do you respond when you don't get your way or you get frustrated? Are you able to wait gracefully? 
How do you handle it when people aren't moving as quickly as you'd like them to? What about kindness? I mean, how inclined are you to lend someone a helping hand even though you're busy or even though you know you're not gonna get the credit for it? How are you doing at encouraging and affirming people? Do you consistently take the time to actually notice people and listen to them? How about generosity? What portion of your time and material resources are actually giving, not just thinking about giving to God or to the poor or to other people? I mean, do you ever think that maybe I'll just give the least amount that I can and feel good about myself? How about faithfulness? Would people around you say that you're dependable? Do you ever use words to deceive or to put your spin on things? Here's an easy one. How about gentleness? How successfully do you speak the truth with grace? Do you ever get angry and inflict pain because you can? Just because it's gonna make you feel good and them feel bad? Over the last week, how often have you come alongside somebody who was hurting and given them comfort? How about self-control? You have any bad habits? You ever give, give in to an impulse? How's your mouth these days? Hey, I want to tell you something. When I think back to that conversation that I had with my daughter in the car driving to Indianapolis, I often think that I didn't end up the kind of dad that she needed and the kind of dad that my kids needed because I was determined to be the guy that I thought I needed to be. And often it was the guy... I didn't push for somebody to model my life after. I just said, I don't want to be like that, and so I'm going to do these things. And what ended up happening is I became the guy that I didn't want to become. And I found that out. Now, I have a great family, and I have great kids and a great wife who love God and love each other, and, and I'm just so thankful for that. But there's a battle that goes on in my heart and I know it probably goes on in your heart too because it's what it comes down to. It's our sinful nature, our flesh. Some translations describe it uh, as that flesh, that sarks, and it represents our effort and our abilities and our determination on our own apart from God. That's what happened with me. And what I've realized is it's just not possible to have that kind of impact in your family's life and in other people's life, to live a life permeated with God on your own. I don't care how strong you are or how self-disciplined you've got. It's just not possible. If you try to live this life based on your own efforts and in your own flesh, then you're gonna stumble. You're gonna fall in either the area of your actions or your attitude. You're either gonna do something that's wrong or you're gonna do something that's right for all the wrong reasons. And there's no victory in either one of those things. You just can't do it, but that's okay because you don't have to. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you to empower you and give you the ability to, to live and experience the kind of life that God has called you to, that real life that Jesus promises. And it all comes back to having confidence in the Holy Spirit and living daily, moment by moment, dependence on him. And then he'll produce the fruit in your life. You don't have to produce the fruit. He'll produce it through your life. Francis Chan wrote a book called Forgotten God. And in it, he said this, the truth is that the spirit of the living God is guaranteed to ask you to go somewhere or do something that you wouldn't normally want or choose to do. The Spirit will lead you into the way of the cross as he led Jesus to the cross. And that is definitely not a safe or pretty or comfortable place to be. The Holy Spirit of God will mold you into the person that you were made to be. And that's my prayer for me. And that's my prayer for you. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Father, thank you I, I thank you today, Father, that I don't have to be perfect to be in a relationship with you because I have grace. 
I don't have to work to be in a relationship with you because you've granted me mercy. You've loved me in spite of me. Father, I pray that everyone who watches this would understand that truth, that you love them no matter what. No matter what's happened in their past, no matter what's going on in their life right now, Father, you love them. You love them more than anyone could. And you have a desire and a plan and a purpose in their life. And your desire is to accomplish that purpose through them and through the work of your Holy Spirit in their life, Father. And so I would pray that people would quit living life on their own effort, in their own deter- trying to determine their life. But instead, Father, would just depend on you and the Spirit, the strength, God in me. I mean, God in me is actually better than God beside me, that he would work through me to accomplish all that you want for my life, for their life. Father, if there's people who need to know you today, I pray that they would quit living life on their own effort and they would place their trust in you and that lives would be changed because of what you've done and that the spirit would come live in them, Father, and strengthen them and mold them, mold them, mold me into the people that you want us to be. We love you and it's in your son's name we pray, amen.